Please use the link below to get the notes, questions and other videos. Don't forget to subscribe, like and share to others for our daily new videos. In microclimate, we said it means climate of a small region. And the small region is like what? Like varies. So the varies are experiencing a different climate. In this case, we're going to look at slope aspect and temperature inversion or inversion wraps rate. Okay, let us proceed and see what happens. Body climate or the slope aspect. We look at, we are, we are looking here, we are looking at the direction in which the slope uh, is facing in relation to, to the sun. That is what we refer to as slope aspect, the direction in which the slope is facing the sun. So if you are in the southern hemisphere, what happens? I want you to look at this diagram. When you look at this diagram, you will find out that one side here is completely dry. On the other side, there is some kind of green. Why? Those are the aspects we need to ask. Why is it that it is in the experiencing such aspects? Remember, this diagram here that we have is from the Southern Hemisphere. And if this is the Southern Hemisphere, we have this side, which is the North, and we have this side, which is the South. Okay, so in this case, if the sun is uh, overhead here, it's, it is striking directly at right angles on this slope, which is facing the north. So this slope here, we call it the north facing slope because it is facing the north altogether. So we have another slope here, which is facing the south. So on this slope that is facing the north, what do you see? The slope that is facing the north, you find out that it becomes warmer because it is experiencing direct sun rays or direct sun insulation, which will not be the same if this sun strikes at this angle. You will find that this slope here is getting the, the sun late or at angles that are less than 60 degrees. Okay, so meaning that this slope will be cooler. And therefore, we shall find out that this one is going to be warmer, but the slope that is not experiencing direct sun will be in the shadow zone. So because it is in the shadow zone, what will happen? It will be cold. Okay, it will be called under slope aspects. We have many things that we're supposed to look at. For example, how is this influencing human activities? Okay, how is it influencing human activities like plantation or planting of trees or growing of crops or settlement itself? How will it influence it? I want you to understand learners that, please don't forget, please remember this. We are saying that in the Southern hemisphere, the slope that is facing the North is warmer than the slope that is facing the south. This slope here we see is facing the south. This slope here we see is facing the north. So the slope that is facing the north is warmer. Why? Because it is experiencing direct sun rays from uh, direct sun insulation, okay? Which are, we say it is perpendicular. Perpendicular means right angles. And somewhere here, we see that this one is having it that is experiencing slanting angles of the sun. Therefore, it will be experiencing less sun and which will make it lie in the shadow zone, eventually it will be cooler. Okay. We go ahead and I want us to understand more of the slope aspect. So when we understand the slope aspect, like I've explained here what happens in North and the South, in case you ask further questions like, well, how is this influencing human activities? We shall find out that in reality, if this place experiences more sun, there will be more evaporation on this other side. There will be more evaporation. So there will be that evaporation taking place here, which means there will be condensation, having more rainfall on this other side. So if we have more rainfall here, how is this important? This will assist basically for the farmers or people who are growing crops. They will grow their crops here, number one. Number two, those crops that do have a lot of sun, they will also be grown along this slope, which is north facing what? North facing slope, because it will be experiencing direct sun and it will be warmer. So even a human settlement, if you want to really settle on such areas, you cannot settle in the shadow zone, why? Because the shadow zone is colder. No one would like to settle in the shadow zone because it is very, very cold. Everyone would love to stay where it is warmer, at least in this aspect of the land. Um, if you are to grow crops, you are going to use this other side for only those crops that will have more of the sun. But if you are to grow crops that at least will have um, 
can uh, persist or can survive in the conditions even if they are cold, then it will be they will be grown around here. However, the main activity that is likely to take place here is the plantation of trees. So trees love cool environment, moist environment, and also those crops that love a lot of moisture will be grown on this other side. But now this side will discourage human settlement because no one will want to stay where it is cold. That is how it is impacting on human activity. Now, there's something here that I want to want you learners to understand. The issue of inversion or temperature inversion. Inversion is coming from the word invert. Okay? Inversion is coming from the word invert. This is what is going to happen. I want you to look at these two aspects. We have what happens during the day when there is direct sun. We also have what happens during the night. I want you to look at this. One diagram will lead us to the other. During the day, there is direct sun insulation. This word insulation simply means incoming solar radiation from incoming solar radiation. Solar means sun. That means the heat that is coming from the sun. In this case of this valley, what happens is that the sun hits directly the valley slopes. So that the valley slopes get warmer, they absorb that heat during the day. Do you understand? The sun hits the valley slopes and the valley slopes absorb the heat during, during the day. And when they absorb the heat during the day, meaning that the slopes are going to be hot. And when the slopes are hot, it simply means that we shall have a region of no pressure. But somewhere at the very bottom, we shall have cold conditions. Therefore, it's going to be high pressure. So winds move from high pressure to low pressure. That's why you're going to have winds moving up. But that is going to come when you're looking at the kind of anabatic and catabatic winds. In this case, I want you to understand what happens, the scenario that occurs during the day. So the scenario that occurs during the day is that when the sun hits the slope, the slopes get heated, they absorb the heat during the day. That is the land. What happens at night? At night, the, the heat, the land, the land that absorbs the heat is now losing it through what we call the terrestrial radiation faster than what it could happen on the water bodies. So radiation takes faster if there's no clouds formation. So what will happen in the night surface? So when this heat is lost at night, what will happen? The slopes here are now getting colder. Why? Because they have lost the heat. So on losing the heat, the slopes are becoming colder, meaning that even the winds that are going to blow off these slopes are also going to get what? To get colder. Remember, we we're talking about the rates at which the slopes are losing the heat. The sides of the slopes here are losing heat faster than the valley bottom. Meaning that here heat is going to be lost at a faster rate, making it colder than what it will happen in the valley bottom. So therefore, we shall have some cold conditions here and we shall have a bit of warm conditions in the valley bottom. And what will happen? So if the winds that are blowing off the, the slopes are very cold, they become dense and heavy. Therefore, they will have to slope down the valley because they are too heavy. Remember, heavy winds slope down. So as they descend down the valley bottom, they are going to displace the warm air that was within the very bottom. But remember, this scenario is now occurring at what? At night. So when this warm air rises, it is rising now from the valley bottom. But above here, there, it's a bit, there is descending cold air. It's a bit colder. And down here, because there is continuous descending of cold winds, it simply means that even the valley bottom is going to be colder. Therefore, the warm air is going to be trapped halfway to the very bottom, this line you see here. So the warm air is going to be trapped within here. And if this warm air is trapped within here, we are going to have a zone here of warm air. That's, that is what we refer to as a thermal belt. But within this zone, temperature is going to increase with increase in height. Therefore, we shall refer to it as temperature inversion or um, temperature inversion or valley inversion or negative rubs rate. So that is the occurrence of this, uh, that is the scenario that is explaining the formation of inversion layers. Hope we are together learners. If there is anything that you don't understand, please don't hesitate posing any question. We shall be in position to assist you 
at any time. Okay, when you log in. Um, we also see another aspect. So we're done with the, that aspect. We also see another aspect, which we call the value width. So this is what I wanted to explain last time. But I, I knew that we're going to find it um, somewhere in the front. So when you talk about the very winds, we have basically two. The first one is the anabatic, and the second one is the catabatic winds. So when you try to refer to anabatic winds, this is basically occurring during the day. I want you to understand that, that anabatic are occurring during the day. So this um, happens. Well, how is this happening? It's happening because the very slopes are getting heated. And therefore, when they become, they get heated, the slopes, they, 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 because they are receiving direct sun, sun insulation, they get heated. So it is a region of uh, low pressure. As they get heated, they become warm. So when they become warm, in terms of pressure, it's a low pressure. And the valley bottom is not heated at the same rate like what happens on the valley slopes. Eventually, we shall have a pressure difference whereby we shall have a low pressure and high pressure. In that case, winds will move from high pressure to low pressure, making those winds rise up, okay? So we say anabatic winds occur during the day as warm air rises, becoming uh, as the day warm air, warm rising air becomes the very slopes are heated by the insulation and that's where the energy is coming from where? From the sun, like I explained the flyer. So I want you to understand that anabatic is day, but catabatic is night. Like I explained before, how does it form? When the very slope is heated, it becomes warm. That is during the day. And when it becomes warm, it's a region of low pressure. But the valley bottom is getting, is, is not heated at the same pace or at the same rate like the valley slope. Okay, therefore, in terms of pressure difference, at the valley bottom it will be high pressure and the valley slope will be low pressure. Apply pressure gradient, Winds move from high pressure to low pressure. That's why they move upwards during the day. And what happens at night? At night, what happens is that uh, um, when the slope cools, it loses the heat that it had absorbed during the day. So meaning that the slopes of the valleys are also going to get colder. And when they get colder, even the wind that is blowing off the, the cold region are also going to get colder. And you will know that cold winds are heavy and dense. Therefore, they descend down the very slope. As, uh, as so happens, what will happen? We shall have the winds during the night descending towards the very bottom. And then further, it explains the, it explains the formation of the diversion layer, frosty pockets as well. But we are going to explain that. Okay. So how do we experience the thermal belt? What happens is that at night, cold air descends on the sides of the slopes and displaces or it pushes the warm air that had accumulated during the day. So cold air descends in the middle of the valley, cold air descending in the middle of the valley, traps the warm air in the middle of the valley, creating a warm thermal belt. So only on nights when there is no wind to mix the cold air and warm air okay so what will happen is that the inversion layer traps the importance of the anabatic winds is basically it drives or it clears all the pollutants that were at the within the valley it pushes it up so what happens air closer to the ground is cooler than the air above it and therefore what happens on the calm nights the upper slopes cool rapidly so cold air sinks down the very slope. The colder air is trapped under the warm air. So the temperature increases with altitude in, the, in a valley. Therefore, polluted air gets trapped and it cannot rise again. So it will be trapped within that area of uh, the inversion. Um, what happens again? There is another concept that I want you to I want to learn as well. It is here what you call the frosty pockets. Frosty pockets. Frost form when the temperatures go below the freezing point. They form when temperatures go below 
a freezing point. What happens in this case? Like I explained, um, uh, what happens at night when this cold air descends, the warm air in the valley bottom is also going to be displaced. So when the warm air is displaced, where does it go? It cannot surpass the cold air that is above. So it's going to be trapped halfway, but there is continuous descendance of cold air on the valley slopes. So the continuous descendance of cold air on the valley slope simply means that the valley bottom will only be occupied by cold air. So the valley bottom as it is occupied by cold air, in that case, we are going to have frost forming because there is continuous descendance of cold air and this descending of cold air will mean that the valley bottom, the temperatures will have to drop below the freezing point. Eventually it will form frosts, okay? So meaning that as this happens, there's this descending air, there's this descending air here. So the warm air that was at the very bottom is going to be displaced, moving up, but halfway of the valley, it will be trapped here. Remember somewhere here, it's at night, we have got some descending cold air. We have the scenario of cold air. So somewhere here, this is where we have the temperature inversion. Therefore, what happens that the warm air that was escaping or that was pushed away from the very bottom here is all going to be trapped within here. So within this zone here, temperature is going to increase with increase in height. So the continuous descending cold air in the very bottom is going to result into the valley bottom having temperatures going below zero. And when they go below zero, frost start forming. That is during the cold nights or during the winter period. Okay. The formation of uh, frost, we said, we said, we talked, at, we talked about the formation of frost. And now, after the frost are formed in the valley bottom, the question is, you might want, or oh, people might want to use the valley bottom for any other reasons, okay? Like planting of crops or settlement and so on and so forth. What will happen in the valley bottom? You will have to only plant crops that are resistant to frosts. And those crops are the ones that will be thriving very well in the valley bottoms. Because crops are sensitive to frosts, are planted um, in, uh, on the higher slopes where it is a bit warm. Okay, so the scenario that I wanted to explain that is explaining canabatic and version layer are these ones. So we have the descending air, which is cold and dense, displacing the warm air. The warm air can't surpass this sinking cold air, therefore it is trapped halfway to the very bottom. So at least run as you understand here, this diagram explain this high, explain this very well. You can see that in this case, you can see that there is heat that is lost on the very slopes here. So when heat is lost on the very slopes here, it means the very slope is becoming cold. Therefore, the very slope becomes a region of high pressure in terms of pressure. The valley bottom is not losing heat at the same rate like the slopes. Therefore, it will be a bit warmer here in the valley slope, meaning that we shall have low pressure here, shall have high pressure here. Pressure gradient, we move from high pressure to low pressure. So when the warm air is displaced, that is what happens, okay? So how do we utilize these slopes? In this case, the slope aspect. We said slope aspect is the direction in which the slope faces in relation to the sun. So if you are from the southern hemisphere, what will happen? The north facing slope will be warmer. So it will be used for you or for a farmer to plant crops and then for settlement. So what happens? In that case, houses will be built on those north facing slope in the southern hemisphere or in the middle of the valley because it is warm. Number two, you plant crops that are not frost resistant in the middle of the valley or on the slope that is warm. Okay, what happens again? We also see that people in the valley can suffer from respiratory problems as pollution is trapped and they cannot escape. I think that is understandable. Alex. Look at this. When the pollution, the, if it is trapped here, and let me say, take an instance that you are staying on the valley slopes somewhere here. So you are can easily suffer from respiratory problems, breathing problems, because of the fact that uh, the pollutants can't escape, they are all trapped there. So you inhale them and that will cause diseases. Working conditions can be difficult in factories at night at the bottom of the valley. Why? Because the valley is extremely 
extremely cold. Okay. Another thing is that at the bottom, you will plant only crops that will survive um, the conditions of frost. When it is very cold, you can plant only those crops that can survive the cold conditions. Okay. That is if you want to survive there. So solution is to the pollution problem. What do you do? You plant more trees to absorb pollutants, find the factories that are really polluting the environment, give incentives to those factories that have at least tried to manage or to solve or to control the pollution, okay? Also introduce what you call the carbon tax. This carbon tax is like a tax that is given to maybe cars or owners of the cars or factories that are really contributing to pollution. So they pay a tax for that. Uh, have total communities uh, above the inversion layer that takes the, pollut uh, the pollutants out. Also um, rooftop gardens, that is basically planting the trees on the rooftop and also use of clean fuels like unloaded petrol that will assist, okay? So in this case, uh, this is what we have been focusing on. This is another view of these aspects. Okay, another view of these aspects. So there are a number of difficulties. Uh, there are a number of different winds that blow in the very bottom. Like we talked about the Antarctic, I've said this occurred during the day, and then they are driven by heating of the slope, and therefore they go down the escarpment. So of these two diagrams, learners, I think you can identify. You can, we say it, anabatic, it occurs during the day. Clearly, they, on the day, you don't expect the moon. During the day, you expect the sun. So by seeing the sun even here, and you see the moon here, we say the day is anabatic, night is catabatic. Another thing that you can look at to say day or night is look at the arrows. These arrows are pointing upwards, okay? They are pointing upwards. They, that means upward uh, movement or upward slope winds. These ones are pointing downwards from the slopes coming down. You can see that during the day when the sun hits the slopes, the slopes became warmer. So when the slopes become warmer, there is evaporation, which is out into condensation forming clouds. You can see in the diagram. Okay. And then this is the temperature inversion, like I explained last time, that uh, temperature inversion, the ground gets cooler, they get cooler, they cool not at the same rate with the very slope. So there will be warm air here in the valley slope. But in the valley slope, this warm air is supposed to do what? To rise up, being trapped halfway in the valley slope that will result into the inversion layer. Okay. Hope you understand learners. Um, don't mix concepts. The difference between dew and, cons and uh, frosts. Okay. So that is basically what I wanted you to understand. So in this case, we are looking at we were looking at the very slopes or the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. This is another version of the diagram. You can see that in this diagram, if this is the this slope here is facing this north north with south facing slope. You see, this slope here is in this case the north. This one is the south. Because they say this diagram is in the southern hemisphere, there is here direct sun insulation. You can see that here it's direct that here. The angle is not the same. What does that mean? This simply means, sorry. This simply means that if this is southern hemisphere and this slope by arrows is showing that it's receiving direct sun, which slope in the southern hemisphere receives direct sun? is the north facing slope. Therefore, this slope here is facing the north, just like you hear the word, north facing slope. The slope must be facing the north. So that simply means this is north, this is south. The slope is facing the north. So this slope is warmer. This slope here is facing the south. This slope here is facing here. So it simply means that this slope here, is south. This slope here is north. So this slope is facing here. That is where the name comes from. So this slope, let me say this slope is X and this slope is Y. So slope X is facing 
the south. So this slope X, we call it south facing slope. This slope Y, we call it north facing slope because Y is facing the north. And we say that in the southern hemisphere, the north facing slope is warmer. Therefore, this Y, we call it north, north, north facing, north facing. Okay. Please don't mind about my pencil. Uh, my pen, I'm already a little bit struggling with this pen. So this slope here is X. So X is facing the south. Therefore, the name of this slope X will be south facing slope. And what I was talking about that this south facing slope, this is where you can plant trees or forests. Why? Because it is cool and cool environment. It's cool, moist. You can favor the growth of trees. So here, this land use can be used for growing crops because crops love sunlight so much. Another thing, the slope will be warmer. Therefore, it will be good for settlement and all other human activities. Hope you understand, learners. Okay. Um, we continue. And uh, look at the next slide. Uh, slope aspect. In this case, I want you to look at this diagram. What do you see? We are saying south facing slope hosts a thinner legal leaf cover. So the result of this uh, shield erosion would somewhat less yield development than on the north facing slope. Why? Because north facing slope is warmer. Therefore, you use it for activities like farming. And when you look at this grazing, most grazing posts are located on the warm slopes. So this is where you keep your animals. So there is evidence of increased vegetation reduction, okay? And then we shall have the development, the gully development on these slopes, surrounding these slopes. So the result of this rapid concentration flows leading to gully erosion. So in this case, we are trying to explain the aspects in the real reality. So no one will have to settle on the side that is cold. Everyone will have to settle on the side that is what? That is warm. Hope you understand, Nanas. Please let us let me also handle another aspect here. The second aspect that I want, or the third aspect that I want to look at, is what we call urban climates. Urban climates. So when you look at our, uh, in this case, we are looking at the climate that is experienced in urban areas. Okay. So under this, we are going to look at the characteristics. We we'll look at the heat urban island, which I look at also other aspects as we proceed. So under this line, what do we, uh, what do we get? We're trying to look at uh, the instances or the aspects that are existing. In this case, when we look at urban heat island, what is the meaning? When you look at urban climate, what do we understand? We are understanding the climate that is existing in urban areas. Please learn us. And I hope you have seen this, that urban areas don't experience the same climatic conditions like it is in rural areas. Why? Because of uh, a lot of reasons that are happening in, uh, uh, in urban areas than what happens in rural areas. Okay, so let's see. How do you see? And another thing that how do you get the difference between rural areas and urban areas? Just in simple understanding, rural areas, what do you see there? You will see that rural areas have got a lot of farms, uh, open land, trees, the houses are too small. You understand? Basically, that is explaining rural areas. When you go to urban areas, you will find that urban areas have got very tall buildings. Um, besides the buildings being tall, they are too congested, uh, density, very many activities, cars, and so on and so forth, that is really existing in urban areas. So in this case, when, in this, when you're looking at this urban climate, we are going to look at basically um, the scenarios or the instances that are occurring in urban areas. And we look at all elements that uh, really define climate in urban areas. In this case, we're looking at temperatures, we're looking at rainfall, we're looking at humidity, 
we are looking at cloud cover we are looking at uh, uh, at uh, speed of wind and all those aspects will be analyzed okay but before we reach the heat urban island or urban heat island what does it mean urban heat island is the situation whereby rural areas are cooler than urban areas or urban areas are warmer than rural areas okay so under this case we are going to find out that urban areas are warmer why that is the most important question why do we say that urban areas are warmer there are a lot of reasons that we look at for example urban areas are warmer because number one the artificial surfaces number two urban areas are so so busy you understand they have got a lot of activities meaning that we shall have a lot of pollutants that absorb heat in urban areas limited water surfaces in urban areas we also see that urban areas have got limited vegetation therefore the whatever pollutants that are raised in, a, in, in the atmosphere or oh, there will be increased carbon emissions and remember plants are very important because they take in carbon dioxide and they release oxygen that helps to regulate the temperatures no water sources in urban areas that will all result into the increasing heat in urban areas look at this this graph here that we have that is explaining heat urban island here we have temperatures here we have the structure of the city or of, of, of on the earth surface down here or that somewhere here we have the city the central business district as you move out you have the rural areas sub suburb areas or and so on and so forth so what happens here the main focus is this and the rural areas you can see here no vegetation here there is vegetation no vegetation oh if it's there it is limited no water sources you can find water sources here okay so in this case the cbd here or the towns or the cities have got temperatures look at the readings 33 or 34 degrees but look at the rural areas it is somewhere here in 30 somewhere here in 30 meaning that it's warmer in urban areas it's cooler in rural areas the question is why i wanted us or what i wanted us to understand is that why do we say rural areas are warm uh, urban areas are warmer and rural areas are what are cooler number one more pollutants like we said that urban areas are very busy cars industries um we have other businesses all those ones are polluting the environment so wherever there there is more pollution that pollution in the atmosphere will result into increase in heat and that increase in heat will make cities warmer and which is not the same in rural areas because there are less activities another thing is that cities have got more industries you know more industries um have got uh pollution uh passing out of uh, waste um uh, pollutants especially when they are product, producing goods so those ones are all set into the atmosphere that will increase the heat and there is few or little or no industries in rural areas another one is lack of vegetation if you find vegetation in rural areas in urban areas it's going to be in smaller areas for example a park okay or some trees that are planted along the roadside which is not the same scenario in rural areas rural areas have got dense vegetation you can find trees everywhere vegetation everywhere so that will mean that it will help to regulate the temperature as the trees take in carbon dioxide which are greenhouse gases that could trap the uh, uh, the heat in the atmosphere to increase the temperature that's why rural areas are cooler and urban areas are warmer okay lots of people many cars that are passing out uh, carbon monoxide all increasing the heat or burning of, through the burning of fossils the um, large surface uh, large dark surface areas remember everywhere you go tarmac roads uh, it's cemented pavings and so on all those ones are trapping heat we also have what we call the artificial surfaces artificial surfaces are that are going to trap heat in urban areas besides that i always add on the use of um, uh, artificial surfaces like air conditioners in order to regulate the heat they use air conditioners but even air conditioners regulate increased heat number two in urban areas you find that their lights are ever on because they are down there in the basements or in buildings they put on the lights that increase or that generate heat making those areas warmer okay 
Um, we shall look at this uh, uh, city climate in details when we are looking at other aspects. So in this case, I want us to look at what we call urban heat island. But now I feel um, we have a lot of things that we have not discussed. City climate, like for example, rainfall. Uh, we have only discussed at length the temperatures, but I want to discuss something that is related to rainfall. Remember I told you that I want at length, you need to look at all the elements that are affecting temperature. I mean, that are affecting uh, climate and weather in urban areas. So this one is, is only focusing on uh, temperatures because we are looking at warmer alongside cooler rural areas. So in case, another aspect that I want us to look at before we go there, besides temperatures, there is rainfall. Okay, rainfall. We know that urban areas receive more rainfall than rural areas. Urban areas receive more rainfall than rural areas. Why? The question is why? The question is why? So how do we answer why? The why part of why urban areas are getting more rainfall is because of what you call hygroscopic nuclei. Those hygroscopic nuclei absorb the moisture that is now uh, rising up in urban areas because of that insulation. So the hygroscopic nuclei, hygroscopic nuclei absorbing moisture, they collect together at the condensation point, they form clouds forming rainfall in urban areas. Remember cities are very busy. There are a lot of uh, particles that are raised in the atmosphere. So those particles, are uh, acting as hygroscopic nuclei that are collecting clouds forming rainfall. So urban areas receive more rainfall than rural areas. The, another thing that also we need to look at is pressure. In terms of pressure, urban areas have got low pressure than what? Than rural areas. Why? We have just said that urban areas are warmer. We know that um, uh, when the temperatures are warm, okay, or hot, the pressure is low. So urban areas have got low pressure. That is number one, because of the high temperatures. Number two, because of the rising warm air. So the rising warm air leaves a low pressure on the ground. That's why urban areas have got low pressure, rural areas have got high pressure. So when you apply a pressure gradient, winds blow from high pressure to low pressure. That means if urban areas have got low pressure somewhere here, uh -huh. And somewhere here, we have got a high pressure. So what will mean that winds will move from high pressure to low pressure, meaning that as they reach low pressure, they are warm, they are warmed up and they rise up in the sky or in the atmosphere, forming clouds to form rainfall. So as they move from, that means in terms of direction, winds move from high pressure to low pressure. Now that they move from rural areas to urban areas that is in terms of even wind direction is explained but now when you explain the speed of wind we shall find out that rural areas will have a high speed of wind why because rural areas have got open spaces so wind can grow anyway in urban areas the speed of wind is a bit low why because the buildings that are too tall and too many act as um as obstructions and friction to the speed of wind. However, the wind is channeled within the buildings that explains that the wind, the, 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 the speed of wind within the, the building corridors is going to be very high as it is all channeled in one area. The speed is going to be high within the channel of the buildings. But generally, urban areas have got low speed of winds. So in this case, I have explained the temperatures, Anas. I have explained the rainfall, I have explained the pressure, I've explained the direction of wind, I've explained the wind speed, and I've explained the rainfall. All most aspects, even moisture. You can talk about moisture. As warm air rises, it is, has got a lot of moisture. Therefore, we have got high humidity in urban areas and low humidity in rural areas. So you can look at those aspects and try to apply uh, all the aspects very well. That is basically what we refer to as um, city climate. Okay.
The next aspect that I want us to look at is uh, uh, what we call heat urban island. So I prefer to start this heat urban island in our next lesson that we shall be having. Therefore, I will stop here for now. But in case of any questions, learners, please don't hesitate asking questions. You'll be assisted there and then, and you handle the questions. But basically, one day I'll come here and I'll see how we can answer questions, Just especially paragraph questions. And then uh, we see how we can, because learners lose a lot of marks when they tell them to answer paragraph questions. Thank you so much. See you again uh, in the next lesson. Bye-bye.